I didn't start out doing multi-million dollar development projects. I started out 15 years ago, um, I started a construction company. And I'm gonna tell you my story about how I got started and things like that, but the natural state of progression was just going through, you know, going through starting a construction company, getting into real estate development, and then, of course, everybody knows that the real estate market crashed, um, you know, five or six, seven years ago. And so we had to change what were our strategies at that point in time, and we did. We got into the apartment building um, business, and uh, and now we think we feel like that the real estate market has kind of come full circle, and so we're back to doing some real estate development um, again. Uh, I started my company, basically got my contractor's license at the age of 21, and we did a million dollars in business in our first year. So these are some of the projects that we did. This is a home we did, in, and I did in Bel Air. Actually, the view is a nicer, the view is more impressive than the actual house, although the house was pretty cool too. This house sold for $14 million. This is a house we're currently working on in uh, Beverly Hills. Uh, home, in, uh, this is in Orange County. We're gonna convert this place into uh, apartments. It used to be an old uh, government offices and things like that. I'm actually from Santa Clarita, which is the northern tip of Los Angeles, or LA County, really. Are you familiar with the LA area? No, I just wondered if you were familiar with that area to de you know, in your choices to develop. Sure. Um, Santa Ana is the heart of Orange, Orange County, and uh, it's, you know, there's all kinds of, there's always opportunity in any market that you're in. I just happen to be in Southern California, so uh, we can find opportunity in just about any market, for sure. The interesting thing about California is that it goes through market cycles. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in just a second, but it, it has booms and busts all throughout its history. And there's a lot of reasons that could go into that kind of um, ebb and flow economy. But uh, if you are a savvy investor, you can play those, those margins pretty well and, and do, do really well. But you have to be careful. You have to be real careful in that case. Um, that is actually the home that belongs to that lot that you see up in the left-hand corner. And that's the house as well. So let's see. I'm going to go ahead and dive into this current project. We're going to do a little case study on this. And I'm going to basically describe how we found it, what we're going to do with this project, and all these other kinds of things. Uh, this is the lot that we're, we're currently purchasing. It's a 25,000 square foot lot. It's on the water. It has a sandy, sandy beach, as you can see. It's a uh, pre-approved to be subdivided into two lots, which is pretty, pretty incredible. In fact, they put a moratorium on splitting lots in the Newport, uh, Corona Del Mar area, so you can't do that anymore. So if you bought a large lot, you're not allowed to subdivide them anymore, which actually creates a ton of value when you're a real estate developer. So we uh, really got or, or fortunate to find one that still has those uh, approvals grandfathered in. Um, it has plans by a world-renowned architect. His name is uh, Biron Genet is a French architect and is very famous in the Southern California and Orange County markets. And, uh, and he's designed two 10,000 square foot homes for this lot, which is pretty cool. The dock that you see here is actually the largest private dock on the West Coast. And it has slips for two uh, 100 foot yachts can be parked there, one for each house, and, uh, which will be pretty cool. And this is the deepest part of the channel. So you can come in and park huge sailboats. One of the things, if you don't know anything about, or if you know about sailboats, you know that they'll have these keels on the bottom. And the larger the boat is, the, the, lar the further deep in the water that they go. And so that makes this dock incredibly uh, valuable. So what I also have with this package is I have an appraisal that was done just a few months ago, a future value appraisal that says that we're gonna be able, when we develop these homes, they'll be worth 22 million each. And so we're, we have a gross uh, potential, uh, gross revenue from this project of 44 million. I would like to know if anybody could take a guess on how much we could have or should have paid for, for lots for something like this. Anybody have any general idea? Three million. Three million, I love that price. I'll take two if they're small. <laughs> um, actually, what I, we're going to pay $11.4 million for these lots. In fact, what, it was kind of a unique situation where the guy who's selling these lots, had, had, he started this project seven or eight years ago, and when the economy changed, he decided not to go forward with this, uh, with this project. And he's had offers for far more than we've agreed to pay for this property. But he came to a point in time where he decided that 
he was just didn't have the energy or the effort and didn't want to go forward with this project. And so he said uh, what he's going to do is deed the property to a charity. It's like a boys home type of uh, a charity. And so when we close escrow, all the funds are going to go to this charity. But what he said was, I don't want to have to do anything or worry about anything during this uh, escrow. And so uh, I'll give you all the paperwork that I have and you do your own due diligence. And if you come to escrow and put a non-refundable deposit into escrow of $350,000, it's yours and you can close basically when you're ready, when you want, when you get all your, when you're ready to go on this thing. So we said, wow, that's a pretty tall order to go $350,000 hard on a project that we basically didn't have any um, real, any real do, be able to do, really do a lot of due diligence on. Usually we'll make all of our checks, double checks and triple checks on everything before we'll go and release, uh, release that, at least that kind of money into an, an escrow. So. Uh, we had to take a little bit of a gamble on this, and so we did, which is, uh, is kind of how we, we operate sometimes, I suppose. I want to show you how, I'm going to move this. I'm going to show you how we do a quick and dirty underwriting on a development project. Now, whether you are going to do a rehab on a house or if you're going to do a development project, the first thing that we want to do is begin with the end in mind. We're going to decide what's the highest and best use for this project or for this property and then determine what the value will be once we've created that highest and best use. And so in this case, we were fortunate because we had two appraisals that said it would be worth $44 million when we're done. And so we start with the, with the end in mind and we, we realize that if we build these two 10,000 square foot custom homes, that we'll have a $44 million value. Now the second thing you want to do when you're underwriting a uh, development or a rehab type of project is pay yourself first. Has everybody heard of that principle before? Pay yourself first. So we like to see about a 30% margin in deals like this. And uh, margins are not necessarily synonymous with net profit, but we like to see a 30% margin in, in a development deal or a rehab deal. And so if I did that, it puts me at about a 30, 30 million dollar um, baseline here. And so this calculation is, is going to take me through the process in a quick and dirty manner to, teach, to show me what I can pay for the lot and still make my profit, right? So it would be $14 million in this particular deal. Is everybody following me so, so far? The 10,000 square foot homes, we've budgeted $500 a square foot. Uh, they'll be top of the line, beautiful, everything, uh, smart homes as, as we were talking about earlier. And uh, they'll cost about $500 a square foot. So They'll, they should cost us about $10 million to build both of them. And then we've got carrying costs and other things. So we've probably got something like $13 million in direct costs after we've paid ourselves first. Everybody follow me on that so far? Yeah. So that leaves me with how much? Uh, I could have paid $17 million for this lot, right? So anything, we call this a land residual. This is the, the most we could pay on, our, on the property. Now it doesn't matter if you're doing a you're finding a junker house in a lower price market and it's maybe a $50,000 home and you're going to fix it up and, and resell it. This is the same type of formula that you're going to use. It doesn't matter how many zeros you put behind this stuff. So I know that my, my strike price is $17 million on this and we've went through the negotiation process and like I said, we've agreed to pay $11 million for on this deal. So we got a pretty fantastic deal which, which we're pretty excited about. Um, Let's see our next slide. Here are actually the real numbers. So this is the kind of quick and dirty outline that I do when we're just approaching a project to see if we even want to move forward. And as you can see, you know, to get these kind of numbers, we're going to verify some comps, probably spend an hour or two online just checking out, uh, verifying what the what comps look like and things like that to get to our first number. But from then on, we can do we can scrub a deal in a relatively quick uh, quick manner. But these are the real numbers and how this how this deal works out. We're buying the lot for $11,400,000. We have lot splits and closing costs for another $250,000. We'll spend another $250,000 on plans and permits. Direct costs on construction is $10,000. And then another $2.5 million in other costs like carrying costs and, uh, and other things like that. Construction costs include labor? Yes. Labor, and materials, everything from, uh, from start to finish. Absolutely. And landscaping and hardscaping and, and all those kinds of things as well. Um, there's the, just a, we, I cut this right out of the appraised 
uh, out of the appraiser's notes. Largest private dock in the United States, $22 million per house is well, basically high. Kind. Oh, good question. So, um, because it's a private dock, is what they're what they're talking about. In other places, in the appraise, in the appraiser's notes, it talks about that too. So, of course, if you have a commercial dock in Long Beach or a commercial dock um, in any other port, they have different, uh, you know, different size qualifications, if you will. But thank you. That's a good question. Uh, it works. Estimated gross profit. So, gross sales forty four million. Less closing costs. When we sell, we're going to pay, these are the closing costs we pay when we sell a property like this. And then less our direct costs leaves us with an estimated gross profit of just over $18 million. The benefits of this deal is that it's the last subdivision in Newport. They're not making any more of these lots in that area. Um, it's the largest private dock on the West Coast. It's a uh, dock located in the deepest point of the harbor and has room for two 100-foot yachts. Um, has ready to build plans, has the most famous architect in Orange County, and we have an appraisal of the future value. So we feel pretty secure about doing this deal uh, going forward. The other thing I want to, want to share with you is on development projects like this, we also have multiple exit strategies, and which gives us a lot of security going into these kinds of deals, realizing that, hey, if we're, as we go along, we're going to be adding value each step of the way. So once we purchase the lot, we're going to go down and finish the subdivision, which will actually cost just a few thousand dollars. So once I have subdivided this 25,000 square foot lot, I've got a, a value right there where I can sell each lot for probably for a higher price than, um, than I initially purchased it for. My second exit strategy could be I could go ahead and finish and finalize the permits on the plans and sell, the, sell this project with finalized plans and exit at that point in time. By the way, having multiple exit strategies gives our investors a lot of uh, security in the sense that, hey, if we start feeling iffy about the future market, we can, we can start exiting in a, you know, sooner than having to go through the whole cycle of the project. Um, exit strategy number three would be to sell one and build one. We could pre-sell the properties, which is basically customary on, on this type of a project. We'll go out and market this pro these, uh, these houses for sale, probably put the shovel in the ground on one of them, and then somebody will come along and say, you know, I would like to buy that house with the plans that you've decided to build, and we'll put down about three or four million dollars, and then I want to have it customized the way I want it. I want to pick my tile, I want to pick my paint colors, and I want to do all those kinds of things. So that's customary on how these types of uh, houses get sold. However, if we feel like the market is skyrocketing, like we did, and you saw that first house in my slides where we sold it for 14 million dollars, um, market in LA was just skyrocketing on, skyrocketing on luxury homes. So we turned down many offers while we felt like the market was just going for you know, a, a rocket ship ride, if you will. And so we initially thought that that house would probably have a value of around $9 million, but we turned down offers at the beginning of construction and let the market do its work. We let the momentum of the market raise those prices and we ended up actually selling it for $14 million like I had said. So sometimes you, it's better to hold on to the spec. You're taking a little bit more risk, but you can do a lot better if you're willing to do that. So we already have all the money to close this deal. We wouldn't have put up a hard uh, deposit if we didn't have the money to close, but we are raising additional capital to uh, finish this project. And what we do is we offer an equity position to our investors, to our qualified investors. We have a $100,000 minimum, and we estimate to pay them between a 25 to 35% annualized return and the project should take no more than three years. So that's, uh, that's how we raise capital for these funds. What we do when we, when we start out on a project, now whether this is an apartment building or a development project like this, if we're gonna, it doesn't matter. What we set up is a single purpose company and I like to draw a pie chart to represent this company. And it can be an LLC or an LP, or a limited partnership or a limited liability company. Um, is, is typically the two types of um, entity structures that we use. And if, if, we, if we made this a corporation, we would be selling stock. And if, we're sell if we made this a limited partnership, we'll be selling partnerships. And if we are making this a limited li liability company, we'll be selling memberships. So it's, those are all basically synonymous according to what type of entity structure 
you put this you put together on. So what we do is uh, my partner and I will create this company and we'll split it into pieces. And usually we'll take uh, a 50% stake on one side and then we'll fractionalize the interest of the other side. And so just to give you a quick and dirty understanding of how this works, if I needed to raise a million dollars to do this project, I might cut this and I might create 10 units or 10 shares available that would sell for $100,000 a piece. And in that case, we would raise the million dollars. My partner and I find the deal. My partner and I uh, take out the loan to uh, finance the rest of the deal. We close the deal and we manage the, you know, manage the asset going forward and, and make sure that we um, take our partners through the full execution of our business plan. And so that's basically uh, the quick and dirty, simple way on how capital gets raised and deployed into these kinds of projects. Anybody, uh, I know everybody's Boston Red Sox fans here, but do you guys remember when the Dodgers sold? I have no, lots of heads shaking no, it's okay, I love it. Um, the Dodgers sold a few years ago, right? And it was purchased by, uh, well, Magic Johnson was the main sponsor. And uh, anybody remember that? It sold for $2 billion, and it kind of like shook the sports world because nobody thought any sports team would be worth that kind of money. Well, what's interesting about that is this is the exact model that Magic Johnson used, him and his partners put together, to raise the $2 billion to buy the Dodgers. And when you think about it, I analyzed this later for a different uh, message that I was giving one time, and I, I, I was looking at the numbers on this, and a uh, season ticket holder pays about 30 grand a year for a seat. And if you calculate that out for how many seats they have at Dodger Stadium, which is right, right over 50,000 or so, he paid about with a season ticket holder, he paid to own the team and the land and the stadium about what it would cost to buy every single seat for one season as a season ticket holder. So is that a screaming deal or what? Like $2 billion was what was worth every nickel in my view for just the land, but he got the team and the rights and all the things too. So, um, but, but my point of that story is this, is this model is exactly how a guy like Magic Johnson raised the capital to buy a $2 billion baseball team. Yes? What vehicle do you use to have like an offering memorandum or, uh, or a CPM? Or yeah, really good question. Um, in fact, I'm going to share with you in a minute my first deal uh, or, or how, I struck, how I did that. But the right way to do it is to form your entity and then you're going to have a securities attorney because we are forming a security when we're doing this. And frankly, a lot of people look at that and say, oh my gosh, this could be, you know, this insurmountable thing or something like that. But frankly, it costs a couple grand, have an attorney draw this up for you. Um, he'll write up all the paperwork. And frankly, what you need to do is disclose to your p potential investors every possible thing that could go wrong um, that you can think of, OK? Yeah. And then, um, and so we'll set up a, uh, we'll set up the company. We'll, we'll draft a private placement memorandum, which is actually that book, we call it. It's usually 20 to 60 pages, depending on how complicated the deal is. Uh, we'll take that book and we'll distribute it to all of our potential investors so that they know that we've warned them about all the risks that could take place. But the reality is most of the people that invest with us are friends, uh, friends family, or associates who already know what we do, know me personally, and, have, and we have a track record of, of demonstrating these kinds of projects being successful. Yeah. Ah, really good point. So I think what the question is, like what kind of return are we looking at on something like this? I'm going to just use this as an apartment complex model, okay? Because that's probably the simplest way for me to describe this. So let's say we were going to go out and buy a $4 million asset. It was a nice apartment complex, had some cash flow. We liked it. It was in a good area. And we're going to buy it for $4 million. So just for rough numbers in this case, um, we can probably leverage this and get a $3 million loan, which, by the way, is so awesome about real estate is you can get incredible financing on, on uh, real estate deals, unlike most other investment products. And so we would need a million dollars to put down on something like this, right? So we'll raise a million dollars. My, par my partner and I go out and get a $3 million loan on this. We close the escrow. Uh, potentially, we usually look for deals that have some kind of value add opportunity where we can raise the rents, maybe 20 bucks a year per unit or, or something like that. Maybe we can go in and fix something or change the name or the branding to make sure that make this value go up in, uh, go up in value. And um, so what you're asking me is about returns. And so let's just assume that this asset goes up, has an appreciative value of 5% a year, 
and we hold this asset for five years. And if we're not, think, we're not talking compounded, I'm just using sim simple numbers, that would be a 25% in 25 increase of that $4 million uh, asset, correct? And so 25% of $4 million is one, another $1 million. So in this theoretical model, we would have a $5 million asset. We'd still only owe $3 million in debt, but again, in real life, our tenants are paying down our mortgage principal reduction every month, so we're actually you know, growing our, uh, our spread in an exponential manner. Value goes up, mortgage goes down, cash flow all along the way, apartments are awesome. And so what we've done here is now we, we also owe our investors their principal back, which is a million dollars, but we've created a million dollars in equity there, right? So if we sold, theoretically in this model, uh, we would have doubled our initial investment. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. So in this model where my, the us as managers keep retain 50% and my partners get 50%, they're getting a 50% return just on the appreciation, just on the equity, um, not including cash flow, tax benefits, and all the other benefits that go into an apartment complex. No, they're li they would be limited partners in a limited partnership. So I, maybe I'm the general manager, and then my 10 investors would be limited partners. So they would certainly own a share of the company. Sure. Would they have no risk? Yeah. Um, every investment has risk, and we want to make sure we disclose it. But I think what you were really trying to ask me was, do they have liability? And that's the awesome thing about limited liability companies and limited partnerships is that as the general partner, we take on the liability from either lawsuits or debt, and our limited partners are completely insulated from that. Their only risk is to lose their principal contribution or potentially not make a profit that we thought we might be able to make. Does that make sense? Yes, please. So then what percentage does your company infuse into the deal? Capital-wise? Yes. Uh, usually none. None? Mm -hmm. Do your investors typically get legal representation when entering the deal, or are they just sign without the money? You know, that's a really good question. Um, some investors do, absolutely do. Some don't. We actually have a lot of attorneys who, um, who invest with us, and so um, I think they're probably the least likely to even read any of the documents, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> no, they are advised to get legal representation. Um, the truth is we use basically the same documents for every deal, so they don't turn out much different. And a lot of our investors will invest a little bit in each deal along the way. The theory being, and this is the great opportunity that we afford them, is that I'd rather own 1% of 100 deals than 100% of one deal. They're diversifying their risk and their own portfolio in that matter. Um, so let's see here. You guys want to hear about some secrets? I, got, I wrote five of them out. No, no, that's, uh, that's exactly what we're trying to do here is train a generation of competitors. Competition is good because it makes everybody rise to another level. So uh, that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. The first principle that I want to share with you is to build your business on a solid foundation of values. I shared with you a little bit earlier about um, my background, but I didn't share that much about my upbringing. I come from a long line of contractors, actually. My dad is a general contractor and my uh, both my grandfathers are general contractors. In fact, my, both of my father's brothers are contractors. So I was basically cursed into a construction family, right? Uh, there was no talk or thought about you should go to college, let alone a, a place like this. And it was all about, well, you get out of high school and you get a job in construction. I said, oh, that makes uh, perfect sense for me. That's what all of my forefathers have done. And so I did that. And um, I was really more interested in you know, drinking and getting into fights and chasing girls and all those things that uh, some young guys do. And, uh, and I got in a lot of trouble. And my dad, who cares, cared about me very deeply, um, I'm sure he prayed for me to have wisdom eventually. And he mailed me a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And so it was a book that radically changed my life because for the first time in my life, I realized that uh, I write the script and whatever I wanted to create for my life, I could do that by setting goals and managing my time and, and moving forward. It also talked about setting a mission statement and creating a value system to move forward with. And so, you know, some people in the world find Jesus and it radically changes their life. Well, this book did the same thing, did that for me. 
It, it took me from a kid who didn't have any aim or any direction, and I sat down and thought for over a year about not only how I was going to start a business and start a company and, and get to be where I'm developing a $44 million project, which is just one of probably eight we'll do this year. Um, it, it took me from there and made me really think about what my principles were and my value systems were. And I think that that is what you need in order to have a successful business, first and foremost, is a sense of values. That's what an investor wants to invest in. They want to invest in a mission statement. They want to invest in integrity. They want to invest in those things. And so my father taught me that my whole life, but it really didn't get it until he gave me that book. In fact, I let that book sit on my shelf for months, and I didn't even want to read it because I said, how dare you send me something? I don't need it to be fixed, right? Well, I really needed, I really needed to be fixed. So build your business on a solid foundation of principles and values. Is How old were you at that point, can I ask? Sure. Do you have a son that's around 20 or so? <laughs> awesome. I, you are so fortunate to be in a room like this, by the way. I wish I had even a fraction of the exposure that you're getting just today. And I imagine that you've probably come to a few of these things. So congratulations on that for both of you. I, um, I was uh, 21. And um, so I was a little, you know, I didn't get it for, for a while. Um, but, uh, but thank God I finally, finally did. And when did you, you start at 21? Yeah, the next year I, had, I, I got my contractor's license. I started a construction company. And um, very immediately after that, I started flipping houses. In my, in my local market. I knew by sitting down and having to think about it, I wanted to be a real estate developer. And so I thought my path would be, well, I know construction. That's got to be half the battle. So I'll start, I'll start there. I'll tell you now, you don't need to be a contractor in order to do real estate development. Um, there, there's, there's a lot faster path. And maybe had I had the right mentors at the time, I could have seen that. But we'll get to that in just a second. So the next principle that I have for you is don't be a jack of all trades. Because what happens when you try to be a jack of all trades, you become a master of none. I would say it's much better to focus like a laser on one thing that you want to accomplish rather than try to do two things or even five things because you're going to dilute your effort and dilute your ability to exceed and be the best at any of those other things that you're trying to do. But if you choose one thing and one thing only and you decide that you, no matter what, you will be the best at it no matter who comes into your, into your path and no matter what challenges you face, that's the way you're going to have success, is focusing like, like a laser and becoming a master at what you choose to do. The next uh, principle that I'll talk about is always being an apprentice. Always be an apprentice. I still have mentors, of course. Um, and it's important to always have mentors. Always be, always, no matter what you get involved with, you want to have a beginner's mind. You want to get into um, a project, start like you know nothing. Don't assume that you know anything, and you'll be able to see a lot more than you would, other, would be able to see otherwise. Um, always having a mentor means having somebody who's already done what you want to do leads you along that path. It's like a catapult. It's going to get you where you want to go so much faster. Now, some of your mentors, um, some of my mentors have been people I've paid lots of money to, to be able to shadow them, go to their workshops, learn from what, what, they, you know, what they're able to teach. Some of my mentors are people just in my market who I basically called them, knocked on their door, begged them, let me take you out to breakfast, let me take you out to lunch, and you know, made them my friend on purpose because I wanted to just open up their brain and see what was going on inside so that I could be like them. And I still have mentors now that I meet with on an almost weekly basis. I'll take them out to breakfast every week and just ask, you know, tell them what's going on in my business, tell them about what's going on in what, the area of my life that I want to learn about, and, and just hear what they have to say and soak it in. And so always be an apprentice means to always have a mentor. Never quit learning, no matter how smart you think you are. And, uh, and you'll, you'll have a catapult to your success so much faster by having somebody who's been there before lead you to the next level. Next principle is go big. Now, that might sound like something that uh, goes without saying, but we started talking about it a few minutes ago. You know, I didn't need to start with a small construction company and do all these things. There's, there are lots of people that 
go big right away, and you can too. But going big for me was my first syndication, my first syndicated deal. And I'll tell you a little story about that. Is you know I was a general contractor with none of the business school experience that uh, you know some people are fortunate to get. And so I didn't know anything about the private equity world or how to raise capital, how to raise private equity for, for deals that I wanted to do. And um, what ended up happening was my great grandfather, or my grandfather, who was a general contractor, used to reinvest some of his profits into a developer's projects. They were building apartment buildings in the valley in, uh, in California. And um, he was uh, one day showing me this offering package on a deal that he had invested in back in the late 70s. And he was showing me, you know, he had invested like $10,000, which was a lot of money back in the late 70s. And uh, he, uh, I'm reading this business plan, and he was like, they took in like 40 investors to do this model to buy this apartment complex. And I went, just the lights just went on and said, oh my gosh, I can do that. Now, I already had partners where I was doing one-off deals. I'd get one partner, we'd flip a house. I'd get another partner, we might build a spec house, do some things like that. But I never thought about, well, what if I had... 10 partners put a little bit of money in each. And so um, when, I, when, that, when that light bulb went off, I, uh, or went on in my head, I should say, I went ahead and I, I, I did everything wrong. And this is not advice, by the way. I ran a, um, an ad in the Wall Street Journal. And I said, OK, I'm going to go develop condos. This was my first shot at thinking big. And I had never built condos before at this time. And so, but I'd been a general contractor and I knew what I wanted to do, right? I had mapped this out. And so, ran out of the Wall Street Journal, cost me like $380 a week, which, you know, was for me at the time was still quite a lot of money. And I was taking a risk. I had my phone rang off the hook for months after that point in time. By the way, it's not, was not technically legal to be advertising that way at that time, but uh, I didn't know any better, right? I'm just getting started. Well, with a three-page business plan to go out and develop condos, I raised a million fifty uh, one million fifty thousand dollars, and we built. We, I bought two houses, tore them down, and built a four-story building over subterranean parking, and uh, had my first successful uh, syndicated development project. And it was based off of I had no idea what I was doing. In fact, I was telling the story just last night with a couple of guys that um, the very last investor, they were seventy thousand dollars shares, by the way. And I was like 24 years old. Um, the very last investor sent me the check. We deposited it. And he calls me up and he says, so Matt, when do I get the private placement memorandum? And I said, you know what? Let me check on that for you. <laughs> I had no idea what he was talking about. But he knew. And he was an attorney, by the way. So uh, I went to my accountant, uh, who was my best advisor at the time, one of my mentors. And I said, oh my god, what do I do? He says, you don't have a private placement memorandum? I said, no. I said, I don't even know what one it is. <laughs> and he says, oh, OK, well, here's an attorney. Go to him, and he'll fix this all stuff for you. So um, you know, if you can write a big enough check, you can fix anything if you have the right attorney. <laughs> so if you, had, if you did have um, a background in business, you would never have ran that ad because you would have known ethically you weren't supposed to be doing it. So it was actually an advantage for you to not have <laughs> That's a really good point. That's true. It's awesome. Um, that's true. So what the regulations are is you can't openly market, you can't publicly market to for private investment opportunity. Then if you did, you would need to be a public company, which costs 100 grand or so to, to register publicly. So to raise a million dollars, it's not worth a hundred thousand dollar, you know, processing system. So yeah, thank you for that. That's actually I never really thought about it like that, but that's uh, that's pretty cool. The next principle is commit and never quit. I put a picture of the Navy SEALs on here because I've made them one of my, uh, a group that I study all the time. I am not a Navy SEAL. I wish I would have had half of what those guys have to become what they've become. But uh, I put a picture of these guys up there because um, one of the stories that I read about these guys who go through BUDS is they sign up for this course and everybody's heard about BUDS in the sense that you go to this you know, intensive training camp and they basically run you until you die or you quit. And, and the, the few guys who make it through, well, then we'll start training you, right? That's basically how the system works because they want to, the only requirement to become a Navy SEAL at the beginning, at that stage, is we want to make sure that uh, you will not quit. 
and they test you and they'll push you and they'll find out where your breaking point is. And, and if you don't have one, they want you as, to become a Navy SEAL. And so one of the tests that they do during your BUDS training is they tell these guys, they tie them up, bind their wrists and their ankles, and they tell them to jump in an Olympic sized swimming pool and they got to swim all the way to the end and all the way back without coming up for air. Now that's impossible for a human to do if you don't have gills, right? What they want to see you do is not come up for air and drown yourself. And if you will drown yourself to become a SEAL, then you are the candidate that we want. Now we'll start training you when I see that you will die for this cause. And, and if you have that same commitment to your business, and you have that same drive for what your cause is about, that you will, you will die, in, uh, figuratively hopefully, for what you're all about, that will attract investment capital, that will attract customers, and that will attract your success. That will attract all kinds of success will open up for you. When you have that kind of commitment, you'll never quit, you'll never give up, and, and you'll make it. There's, no, there's nothing that can stop that when you have that kind of a drive. And so I love to study these Navy SEALs because of that. I want to talk to you about uh, using market cycles in real estate. I'll do a quick illustration of this. I wanted to share with you about market cycles because um, it's really important when you're looking at whatever kind of, if you're doing real estate investing, um, to know what the market's doing. You can, you can be successful in any market, any location, as long as you apply the right techniques in the right market cycle. And so I've done a little illustration here, and actually it's, it's kind of smashed, so it looks a little bit more extreme than typically goes. But what we have here is a, is a market cycle. It goes up. It crashes, it flattens out, it goes up, it crashes, it flattens out. Now this happens in every investment, uh, in any kind of investment. If you're in stock market, this might happen in seconds, up and down, up and down. It might happen over the course of a couple of days. But in real estate, it's more like a slow moving ship, and so you can predict it a little bit better. And that's one of, one of the things that I really like about real estate. And so you might look at like in the early 2000s, we had this run up. Um, until we had a bubble, 2000, late 2007, things started falling apart, 2008, things started crashing. So that was kind of this market. These are labeled seller's market. Phase one goes up, seller's market phase two hits the peak, and then we start hitting a, a buyer's market as things go down. Now, I kind of illustrated, to you that, illustrated that to you with dates, because in my view, I believe, and depending on what market you're in around the country, you might want to invest differently depending on where the market cycles are. I'm going to suggest to you that in 2000, well, I'm going to tell you exactly. In 2010, when all the, everything was crashing, Texas started to do really well. And so I took my investors and we went to Texas and we started buying cash flowing apartment buildings because I want to buy cash flowing properties in markets that are having momentum going on, right? I wish, I'll just let the momentum of the market do all the work. So if I buy it right now with cash flow and then the market delivers appreciation, that's the easiest type of investing we can do. I love those kinds of investments because they're safe, they're secure, and they rise with, with the marketplace. And by the way, what I look at is if it cash flows down here, it's probably going to cash flow after the, after the uh, market tanks again, too. I wasn't always in apartment buildings, though. Back in, uh, in the roaring 2000s, all I did was development, which is about the riskiest type of real estate you can do. And what I saw was in 2008, all my buddies who had invested in apartment complexes were doing really well as foreclosures were happening, as uh, people couldn't get loans for new houses, rents started rising, inflation started happening, rents started going up, and my apartment buddies were all doing really well while all my developer buddies were having a real hard time because there was no loans, there were no construction loans to do development with. So what I saw that it was a nice safe baseline and so we added that as one of our strategies as, as a company. So for the last, uh, for, since 2010, for the next five years, we have been acquiring these safe, secure, cash flowing assets in emerging markets and letting the momentum of the market ride their way up. Now that we found ourselves in a different kind of market cycle, we kind of found ourselves in a different position, we're starting to do more development, which is exciting because we've seen that market come full turn. So just as a real, real quick, quick capture on this, um, buy and hold at the bottom of an upward trending market and you want to dump everything you can that doesn't cash flow before you hit that peak and then on a downward market is a great market to be turning to be flipping houses to be doing transaction type deals um, you can flip buy fix and flip all the way down in the downward market cycle because you're you're not really 
uh, letting time affect your deal. You're buying it low, you're, you're, you're adding, physically adding a value, and then you're selling it at a, at, a, at a profit margin, usually within a 90 to, you know, three, mo three months to six months kind of time cycle. So you're not really going through a whole market cycle in real estate in that short amount of time. So you want to be aware of your market cycles and you want to deploy different strategies in your markets depending on when you're, where your market cycles are. If I would leave you with parting advice today, I would just say one thing. I would say live fearless. No one's promised tomorrow. And so go out and do everything you can to be what you want to be. And I'll tell you the hardest part about life and hard, hardest part about business is figuring out what that one thing is that you want to hang your hat on and commit to without, without any distraction. So live fearless, decide what your one thing is, and go after it with, without any obstacles. Plow through those obstacles and go get it. Thank you, guys. Thank you.